We turn now to consider intellectual property strategy. One of the perhaps traditional control-like strategies that used to be taught uh, as one of the two main things you could do to commercialize innovations in business schools. If you recall, uh, this is a strategy where you are investing in control, most notably things to protect your intellectual property, but you're oriented towards collaboration. That is, you're trying to take your ideal at some fundamental essence and sell it to um, other people who are currently on the value chain. There are, again, a constellation of choices that emerge from that. Obviously, competition, it's defined by that. In terms of customer, you are trying to sell to customers who are on the existing value chain somewhere on the segment, maybe an established firm. So you have to think about well, what is your creation for a value for their customers. In terms of your technology, if you're going to sell an idea, it has to be able to transfer easily to other firms, it has to be used by them. So it's probably on the same technological trajectory as incumbents, and it's easily generalizable and transferable. In terms of your identity, what you are is an ideas factory. You have an integrated theme of innovators and IP managers, you're going to double down on, on um, people who can make deals for you and who can enforce the law. Externally, you are going to be dealing with a whole lot of complementary asset providers, and you're going to be uh, effectively an arm's length in terms of your ability to deal with them. And in terms of the ecosystem, you're going to look for specialized clusters for the innovation functions and where you can access resources that give you deal-making expertise. In terms of your value creation hypothesis, your value creation hypothesis is going to be uh, that you can actually do this, that you can actually transfer, you can transfer novel innovations uh, into the value chain. Okay, that has to be done. If you can't do that, if you haven't created value within the value chain and you can't, independent of your own company, do so, you are going to fail and this is going to be a bad path for you. In terms of uh, your value creation, hypo value capture hypothesis, I'm sorry, this part here, what you are trying to do is developing strong bargaining power and a reputation of enforcement that allows you to earn more and more. Those are the things that will be most valuable to you. As an example of this, we've already talked in a previous lecture about the case of Liquid Glide. Liquid Glide, you'll recall, was able to build a coating onto bottles that allowed liquid to flow nicely out of it. A uh, great example here was the, uh, uh, was the uh, uh, tomato uh, ketchup example. And off it came, could give stains, I guess they could put some stuff there, but it would be ultimately uh, not in the bottle, and uh, you'd have to, uh, you'd have to be uh, not part of society to not want an easier way of doing that. Anyway, well, what did they do? What they were doing was, they weren't building the bottles themselves. They could do that. This company, what they did was licensed. They wanted to license their technology to existing bottle makers, and who did they end up seeing? Of course, was Elmer's Glue, and in March two thousand and fifteen, they joined forces to be the supplier of uh, uh, this uh, uh, technology to them so that glue could get out of these bottles. We see IP strategies in other f f forms as well. Um, obviously, a great example of IP strategy is uh, that used by J.K. Rowling. It's pictured here. J.K. Rowling uh, is the inventor, <laughs> inventor if you could say that, of Har the Harry Potter universe. And she is engaged in many licensing deals, okay? She came up with movies. She, of course, came up with other uh, materials and books and has uh, Harry Potter World sitting there right there in Universal Studios. She didn't do any of these things. Well, she has some uh, hand in the movies, uh, I, I would guess. Um, actually, more recently, she's done a play uh, as well, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. And so she's Britain's second richest woman behind, of course... Uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, and uh, has got that wholly from an IP strategy. There are other examples of this. 
uh, this was an inventor of uh, spinal implant technologies and was basically able to get a favorable decision for, uh, uh, to enforce his patent, uh, including uh, $1.35 billion in payments uh, and rights to future inventions. So you end up in, in legal uh, uh, issues often with this type of thing. Okay, so that's your choosing uh, your IP strategy. Um, this is a bit more details about it. Obviously, there are enough companies that do this. Some very interesting ones. You'll read more about Dolby, for instance, in the book. Uh, and, so, and also Getty Images as well. Again, IP strategy has both a value creation hypothesis and a value capture hypothesis. Let's see how those play out. Well, you know, when you're choosing your customers, what you're doing is you're focusing on uh, value creation for known customer groupings. We talk about Bluefin Labs in the, in the book and how they choose their customers in that regard. In terms of choosing your co competition, what you're doing is you're trying to gain control through patents, trademarks, and copyright of a novel invention. And therefore, you can take that and put it into other people's products, even if you don't do it yourself. A great example of that is Dolby, a way of making... Um, uh, sound recordings uh, sound a lot lot better when played through uh, stereo equipment. Well, what Dolby did, they didn't build the stereo equipment, but they licensed uh, their technology to the stereo equipment, and this symbol ended up being on that. This is well before the Intel Inside, if you may recall that. And Dolby was uh, thereby able to add value to those in saying that you had this uh, thing. You also had a, a little on and off switch uh, that Dolby uh, had put on there, uh, where you could s switch on Dolby versus uh, not. Um, and th that was really clever because people could then see what the effect of that was uh, in terms of the uh, sound quality. And so they did a very good job. And basically, you couldn't sell one of these uh, stereo without Dolby, and therefore, you had to license from them. And they did that, and they built into other things, including video as well. There are many tools that you can use as part of an IP strategy. Obviously, formal intellectual property protection, patents, trade, copyright trademarks are important, but you can also design your products such that it makes it very hard for people to um, uh, take your ideas out of that. This often happens, of course, in digital uh, media uh, with things that prevent copying. Um, and you can also uh, engage in contractual agreements such as trade secrecy, non-compete agreements and things like that to protect and control your IP. And there have been numerous examples of that. In terms of patents, what are patents? Patents are a quid pro quo. They are a right to exclude anyone from using your idea in exchange for telling the world what that idea is. So you get a 20-year patent term, uh, usually from the fa date of filing, um, and our usual justification of that is we want this protection so that people can earn a reward from their innovations. The standard for patentability is, generally speaking, three criteria. Non-obviousness, novelty, and utility. Non-obviousness is that somebody doesn't see this one coming. Novelty is that it's not it's significantly different from what's come from before. And utility is that it's not useless. Um, you can look at weird patterns to see all sorts of ones where... That's a little skirted. Um, the specialized uh, examiners have a lot of discretion in doing this. Um, uh, so they, so basically, uh, it'll go to someone with knowledge of the field. Of course, that's going to be an issue if you have something that crosses over fields. Uh, and then in the United States, the Court of Appeals or the Federal Court uh, spends a great role in uh, hearing patent appeal. Uh, appeals and enforcing uh, or restoring the patent law. There has, as a result of that, been a big rise in patenting over time. The courts were strengthened at about this time period, and you've seen there that we've had a massive growth in the number of patents being issued in the United States and elsewhere since that time. Uh, and alongside this, we've had a dramatic rise in the licensing of those patents, which is the usual means by which patents are commercialized in an intellectual property strategy. And so we've seen that trend increasing as well. Um, obviously, there's a lot of controversy about this. There was this great case, Myriad Genetics. Myriad Genetics was a company that was uh, trying to patent the 
uh, gene for breast cancer or the discovery or exploitation of it obviously raises a ton, ton of issues that are still on to this very day. Um, and moreover, you should not know, you should know that getting a pattern is not the be all and end all. It is a signal, it's a signal that you might have some protection, but there's some uncertainty associated with it. And that uncertainty really matters. You may not get the pattern. Even if you get a pattern, it might get overturned. Even if it gets overturned, you might not have the full range of rights to exclude, depending on how useful the patent is for the uh, economy. These are very complicated issues, okay? And they're going to impact on whether you think an intellectual property strategy is a good idea. Chances are the patent alone won't be enough for you to do that. Copyrights um, are similar, but they are the right to exclude for people from copying. There's no pre quid pro quo, you don't have to tell anybody about it. The usual reason for copyright is to protect artistic work, uh, but there are nuances to that law. Trademarks are the uh, way in which you can secure a name for your product to stop people getting confused between your product and someone else's. That can be extremely valuable. This is not necessarily just a big deal for an IP strategy, this is a big deal for a lot of strategies. Trade secret law comes in. Trade secret law is currently what uh, 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 Google's Waymo is trying to enforce against Uber, who uh, acquired Otto and its employees, uh, and are trying to use that for, to, to say that you cannot take the secrets of self-driving cars with you to some degree. Uh, it operates differently in different jurisdictions with different powers. Uh, the best way to get secrecy, as we'll see in a second, is actually to be secret. Sometimes you can control ideas in other ways. This is uh, one of our favorite little guys. This is a guy standing here with a shotgun. He's built around his apple orchard to uh, apple tree uh, some actual protection to stop people from being able to get his uh, specialized seeds. Uh, so, you know, you don't always have to think about the legal mechanisms to do stuff. Similarly, we have other um, uh, intellectual property strategies uh, or things that look a lot like them. Uh, you may uh, end up uh, 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 collecting data of some degree. You may end up uh, uh, appropriating code uh, to some uh, dimension and, and being able to keep that secret. Or uh, you might try to uh, take your algorithm, uh, as Google did in terms of the page rank algorithm, and try and protect that. Uh, in their case, they had options to sell that and chose to. In terms of the identity, you want to build an ideas factory. You are going to be specialist in the production of ideas, not in the commercialization or exploitation of those ideas. So that means that your company, if it's going to be more than one trick pony, has to be a source of new innovations. And that's its value creation hypothesis. Uh, and the, the value capture hypothesis is going to be that you're not going to give this stuff away easily. And those are the things you have to balance out there. So the negotiating strategy will be an important part of any IP strategy playbook. So if you have a venture that is pursuing an IP strategy, you've got to establish a strong, strong bargaining position. This means real commitments matter and things like momentums matter. This does not mean that you are going into the art of the deal. What you want is to do the science of the deal. You want to have real things matter, not fake tactics such as banging your uh, fists on desks and looking tough. Um, so you want to think about these negotiation courses and you want to structure uh, your deal so that you understand who you're negotiating with and you can get to yes. Get to yes. Call uh, your lecturer for that one. A case which we talk about in the book where this was very effective is that of Millennium Pharmaceuticals. Millennium Pharmaceuticals came up with ways of basically being able to produce uh, new drug uh, options and to be able to commercialize them in various ways. You should say, hint, hint, some of our AI companies are doing very similar things. What did they do? They had a superstar advisory board. They had a tight integration between IP management and research activity. They structured the scope and sp process of each negotiation separately, so to exploit as much to the, uh, as possible. They had to build a license. Uh, they had licenses build on each other, so that the, once they got one negotiation, they had improved terms for the next one. And this led to measurable deal outcomes of time, 
which you can see here. Initially with Roach, 6 million upfront, 10 million per year milestone, etc. But look at how these improve as they did more and more deals. This is something to pay attention to. Not surprisingly, uh, that has led to their up and downs, depending on um, how they've uh, gone um, in terms of uh, getting these new deals. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, another story. Uh, IP uh, value uh, from an IP strategy is only as good as your ability to make deals over time. So there can be a bit of vol uh, volatility there. Okay. For startups who are pursuing an IP strategy, IP management matters. Okay. The timing of cooperation is closely tied to getting a patent. This uh, graph here shows you the time before uh, getting a patent. You get a patent and then the time after. And what this is showing you is the probability of getting a license deal in any of those times. And you can see it's not much, not much, not much. It gets a little bit more as you get closer to getting a patent. And then it shoots right up. And the, the period of time after, which, after you've got a patent is your prime deal-making opportunity, okay? Actually, if you look a little closely here, it is not just that. It's actually about six months before when you get this uh, letter from the patent office um, saying you're definitely going to get your patent. Why does this matter? Well, once you've got the patent in hand, you know what's there. Everybody knows what's in the patent. They know the scope of the patent. Most patents are granted. The question is how broad they are. They know the scopes of the patent, so they know how to make that deal. We've had examples in the lab of uh, companies that have been pursuing uh, these mo uh, licensing models. The Nimi uh, Heartbeat Lock, as you've seen it uh, here, uh, actually launched in 2003, and before they came to the lab, were pursuing a licensing model. They found that that didn't work. What happened is the value creation hypothesis hypothesis failed something will come back later they then pivoted and started away from an IP strategy what happens when you disclose an idea okay there's a great case here this is Bob Kearns he's a engineer in Michigan he invented the intermittent windshield wiper this is the thing that is on your everyone's car on your windshield, you've seen it before. It's a, it's, it's basically a wiping off. Notice my drawing here. Wiping off rain that is coming down onto the intermittent onto the windshield. The windshield wipers used to go back and forward, back and forward, uh, uh, without much, uh, you know, fast or slow. But what the intermittent windshield wiper would do is they'd come down, pause like a blinking eye and then come back up again okay thereby providing a much more efficient way of uh, dealing with different sorts of rain that was going on well what Bob Kearns did is he uh, developed all this and then he drove his car with this intermittent windshield wiper with it all the mage me mechanisms in a big black mox entitled property of Bob Kearns do not open and the Ford engineers looked over it and uh, they didn't to cut a long story short they didn't buy this idea they ended up uh, uh, expropriating it and then seven years later Kearns was at the trade show and saw it in a brand new uh, Ford uh, this led to an entire story uh, whereby uh, Kern sued Ford for patent infringement. It took like 20 years to resolve. This whole issue here is an issue that is called the disclosure problem. It was first articulated by this man who is Kenneth Arrow, won a Nobel Prize in Economics some years ago for many things. Uh, actually, probably not this. Uh, but basically, he says, you know, what's the problem with an ideal selling model? Okay. If you want to sell an idea, you have an issue. You have to tell it to someone. You have to show people what the idea is, because otherwise they're not going to know what they're buying. Okay? But the problem is once you tell them the uh, uh, idea, then they know the idea. So why pay? Why pay? It's a bit of an issue. Okay? 
you either keep the idea to yourself or you're going to end up selling it for less. This is a fundamental paradox and that's why we call it the disclosure problem. Okay, one way of getting around the disclosure problem is through a patent. You can tell people your ideas. In fact, you have to do it through a patent. And so as patent protection has become easier to get, we've seen an increase in licensing as well associated with that. We also see, and we did this in a study a few years ago, when you go to startup firms and you ask, you know, have you got a way of stopping the incumbents from ripping off your ideas? Uh, and if you do, that increases the probability that you will um, uh, end up licensing it to them or cooperating in some way. Also, what increases that probability is when the incumbent has any complementary assets that you want to combine with your own to make things work. So basically, that's the best of both worlds. But the important part here is the uh, exclusion power stops issues associated with the disclosure problem and being able to sell ideas. Okay. And so that was part of what we did in this later study, thinking about how actually getting a patent actually led to more licensing deals itself. The patent itself was important, not just, just uh, potentially or uh, an optional. There are several different ways of resolving the disclosure problem. You can use secrecy, use competition, hold something back, use intellectual property protection, and use a buyer's reputation. With regard to secrecy, this is a way of keeping the idea under your control. The Chamberlain family in France invented forceps delivery and didn't tell anyone about it for a better part of an entire century. Coca-Cola kept its uh, formula secret, as did Thomas's muffins, and Isaac Newton kept the secret of calculus for 15 years. With regard to competition, we've already uh, talked about the case of this person. With regard to competition, we've already talked about this person, Bob Kearns. Bob Kearns invented the intermittent windshield wiper and tried to sell it to Ford. So what could he have done? Well, the answer is that he could have used competition with GM to give himself some leverage. That is, he would drive his car up to Ford, try to sell them the intermittent windshield wiper, and if they had, as they did, not purchased it, he could then threaten to take his invention and literally give it away to GM. That threat is credible because the idea seller, in this case Kearns, would expect to be expropriated anyway, so he's got nothing to lose. And, of course, if he could build it himself, you'd be able to just do this. Now, this takes something quite bold, but at least it shows the potential of competition to allow someone with an idea who's at risk from expropriation to be able to get paid for that idea. Because what they do have, a, have is the ability to let that idea loose and for you to lose uh, the power of exclusivity, which is perhaps something these car companies would have wanted. The issue, of course, is how tough could someone be? When we think about Bob Kearns, it's not clear that he would be able to do that. Okay. In terms of uh, other options, there's reputation. If you find the right person to sell your idea to, who could expropriate you but is interested in getting approached by other entrepreneurs, they won't do so, and they'll develop a reputation for it. Throop Wilder developed a Internet in a Box, a simple solution for small businesses to get onto the internet. And he ended up commercializing uh, that innovation and uh, selling it in the end to Cisco. Cisco turns out to be a company that has a reputation for uh, purchasing companies and treating them well. And so that is another thing that you can look for to avoid the disclosure problem. There's being bought and there's being bought by Cisco. Finally, in terms of a follow-up, uh, an actor, Greg Kinnear, uh, took ABC to court many years ago for expropriating the idea, or alleged expropriation idea, or actually it turns out they did, for America's Funniest Home Videos. 
he won that case on appeal. Okay, who is Greg Kinnear? Greg Kinnear is the person who played Bob Kearns in Flash of Genius. Okay. And that's basically it. So there's intellectual property strategy. There's a lot to it, a lot of different parts, but you can see some of the issues that you face.